Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm Bruce Teichman. I've been with Cogent since, uh, well, this will be my ninth year. And then doing uh, M&A prior to that, probably since uh, 2008. So uh, have some experience in the area. I think today we're going to start out, it's going to be a little cadet, you know, to begin with. And then we're going to, you know, get a little further, further along. So one of the main things when I think about M&A is kind of this is where it begins, right? Kind of how do you stand out and why is anyone even interested in merging with you or, if, or are you buying another organization? You know, what is separating you really from the pack? And generally, you know, every buyer, as you know, they're looking for what we call the right fit. Right? There's a lot of this culture stuff and, um, you know, that's a very personal thing. We'll talk a little bit more about kind of how to get into that. But some of the, uh, you know, the basic reasons, of course, are just geography is a huge one, right? Where you are. So if you're in Texas and if someone wants to expand in, in Florida, you know, it, it just doesn't matter. <laughs> Nothing else matters, right? You're not there. Uh, revenue, earnings, of course, recurring revenue, which is huge. Uh, growth, you know, you can be a $10 million company making 20%. That sounds great except if the prior year you were 12 million making 25%, right? So you gotta be going you know, in the right direction. Uh, customers, talent, capabilities, you know, these are all uh, pretty much what I call table stakes, right? The thing is, everyone has these, right? You're in a geo, you have revenue, you have earnings. What, what really everyone, I think the buyers especially, are looking for is what sets you apart? Again, what makes you different from the guy or girl to your left or right? Um, Sometimes it's size and other things, but we'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk about ways to kind of differentiate yourself. And essentially, how do you stand out and maximize your value by not doing what everybody else does? Um, as a quick show of hands, who here, if you could raise your hand, has been involved in at least one M&A transaction? Just I get a sense of the room. Yeah, about a third of the room. How about five or more? Okay, a few less, helpful. And then a bunch, obviously, none at all. So, uh, so let, let me talk a little bit about kind of what, you know, what matters, do, do's and don'ts. And, you know, honestly, some of the big uh, lessons, you know, in M&A is really just how you comport yourself. So this graphic, I think, says a lot. You know, people think M&A can be, you know, is this, right? And you know, I had to put my clicker away. We say it's, it's this, right? It's, it's cooperation. And we liken it to really the, the dating process, right? Dating and engagement and marriage. And if you're doing this while you're dating, you're not getting to the altar, all right? So it's kind of a, really a mindset. You need to be, even if you're not absolutely ready to sell, if you're having a conversation either on, uh, as the buyer you know, or as the seller, uh, you know, your, your attitude really matters. So, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of emotion. Some people think, especially the attorneys perhaps, that this is, you know, transacting real estate and it's far from it. It's so personal and so, uh, you know, relationship driven. And so, you know, back to the culture statement, typically you're only talking to the founders, right? You're not having an opportunity to really meet everybody else. So how that uh, CEO or founder is, is representing themselves, you know, is speaking very much to that culture. So you gotta, you know, you gotta be on your best behavior, be yourself, but, but put your best foot forward. And that's not always the case. And it's also on the buy side. Uh, we have something called, you know, kiss my ring, right? Because I'm bigger than you and better than you. And you know, it's just, it's not gonna work that way. So uh, be on your best behavior. Transparency is, is huge. It is the kind of thing that, you know, especially in a due diligence process, and we're gonna be talking a little bit about you know, again, when someone is sort of looking at your business in depth, right? So diligence, whether that's pre-LOI, which is where it starts, or, or post-LOI, a deeper level, uh, you know, you just need to be transparent. And I think too many folks find themselves, they think it's playing poker, you know, and they're keeping their cards close to the vest. And it's really, it's a, it's a bad idea. Ultimately, it's gonna come out. So if earnings aren't great, if you have a couple of rocky employees, if there's a customer on the bubble, if what have you, the, the better thing to do is get it out there, right? Be open. The other thing that we see that does make the difference, I think, between getting it done and, and even maximizing your value is, is responsiveness. 
Again, I don't know if it's a close to the vest thing. Excuse me. Sometimes people are just, you know, maybe a little too busy. But if you're sending an email to, you know, hey, thanks for that meeting two weeks ago, again, back to dating, it's a little, you know, it's a telltale. So with everything in M&A, you know, it's about timing. And if you haven't heard, time kills deals. So you want it to, you know, go as rapidly and, uh, you know, on pace as possible. So I can't underscore enough, just, just being responsive, uh, replying to those emails. Uh, it should be, if you're genuinely exploring it, again, on either case, it's not your day job, right? If you either you have a company that you're running or as a buyer, if you're a strategic buyer, maybe if you're a financial buyer, it's different. It's not your day job, it almost needs to be. You need to treat everybody almost like a customer. And then, you know, your organization, the verb, right? Uh, be organized, know where things are. And it depends, if you're a smaller organization, you know, you, you, you hopefully are very tapped into everything, but you're also, you know, spinning 22 plates. And if you're a larger organization, you might have delegated most of this out to sort of middle management. But ultimately, again, not that many folks are involved in this process. So as the, the owner of the business, you need to be just very organized. And we're going to talk a lot about, you know, what that means and kind of having your act together. And then the other thing is, is your advisors and your, your circle of influence. Um, you know, unlike dating and marriage, where it's really just pretty much your decision, I mean, I hope, and most people are going to talk to their attorney, they're going to talk to their CPA, they're going to talk to their spouse, they're going to be involved, you know, in this process. And so ultimately, you know, take their counsel, but realize it's your business decision, especially when it comes to CPAs and attorneys, they're going to lose a client if you sell your company. So, you know, sometimes that works against you. Um, but I would say on the, on the CPA front and the attorney front, someone with M&A experience and, and find out if, if yours has it, you know, and if you're generally considering doing this on either side of the fence, get, get counsel that is uh, familiar with mergers and acquisitions. So I don't know how many remember Goofus and Gallant. You've got to be of a certain age. <laughs> but I think it kind of sums it up, right? We have this phrase where, uh, you know, if things start going off the rails and the attorneys are like redlining like crazy or what have you and it's kind of running around with scissors and it just reminds me of this, right? That's goofus. Be gallant in this process. All right, so contracts. This is obviously one of the more important elements in mergers and acquisitions in terms of what is actually being acquired. So for the buyer, you know, when they're looking at these agreements, it is all about this risk assessment, right? I mean, everything they're looking at is about risk assessment. You, of course, you personally know your clientele, usually. You, you know, even if you have a handshake deal, maybe that's good enough. But for someone coming from the outside and looking in, you know, things really have to be buttoned up. So number one, have contracts for 100% of your active agreements. Have, have them all. Uh, you'd be amazed when we're into due diligence how many missing agreements there are when you're looking at the customer base. And you know, who, who can raise their hand and honestly say you have 100% of every agreement that you're signed up for? Yeah, not, not too many folks. So here's a couple of, you know, these are some takeaways. I mean, you know, you think about it, like I said, it's not real estate, it's not selling a house, but all the stuff you want to do when you're about to sell, you know, you're supposed to do it beforehand so you enjoy it. The <laughs> same thing goes here, right? Do these things now while you're operating the company. So make sure you have all these agreements. But beyond that, okay, I have them, but hey, they're not fully executed. And that is another huge one. Uh, you know, you've signed it as the MSP. I'm sure at some point in time your customer signed it, but you don't have that copy. And if you don't have that copy, it, you know, it's, it's not a, a valid contract at that point. So, uh, so keep the full fully executed version, not just signature pages, have, have access to it. Ideally, it's digital. Eventually, you're going to have to provide every copy of every single contract with every customer, with every vendor, with employees, and so forth. And so you might as well have it scanned and digital. And let's just talk about unexpired. So a lot of this is about terms. And again, we're not going to tell you how to run your business, but I'll tell you from a sort of best practices standpoint, and again, maximizing your value. Um, there's a lot of agreements that, hey, they are fully executed, and I got them. Like, here's the customer contract, but it expired in 2013, you know, and you've just been building them ever since, and they pay. So there's sort of this de facto agreement there. But again, it's not really uh, valid. So, uh, you know, make sure that 
you, and I, I'll, I'll tell you about a couple of tips on how to you know, sort of keep everything current. Make sure everything's not expired. And then the other thing we see sometimes is for those who are staying on top of it, here's the addendum for this year. We changed our services and they're adding to it. So they have all the addendums for the last five years, but they just don't have that original contract. Again, it doesn't mean anything without, without the original. So in, re in regards to customers, again, I think on the smaller end of the spectrum, right, so if you're under a million dollars, I see this most often for the ones that are, you know, larger than that, maybe not so much. But, uh, you know, there are customers that you might have legitimate uh, arrangements with and you don't, have, you don't have paperwork. But what's really missing there, hey, listen, the money keeps coming in, you're making profit, but there's just no protections without that contract. Right? The limitations of liability is a huge thing. And for any buyer, when they're stepping into that agreement, uh, you know, that's, that's what they're missing, right? So if the paperwork's not there, and they're gonna have to put new paperwork in front of that customer, that's kind of rocking the boat, especially early on. We don't wanna make changes, right? When you think about post-deal integration. So a big reason for the customer contract simply is, you know, terms and conditions. Yes, rates and services and what have you. But, but the limitation of liability. Uh, the contract length, this is always a debate. Hey, it's harder to sell a three-year agreement than it is you know, a one-year agreement. And I get that, and longer is better, but what's more important is the outs. So again, we see fully executed digital three-year agreements, but they have a 30-day out for any reason, right? So it's really, you know, it, it's just, it's kind of a month to month is what that is. You want to, it's fine to have an out. Uh, one of the things I've seen a few times over, which I thought was a really uh, good idea, is in a multi-term agreement, one year, two year, three year, to have a six, 60, the first 60 days for any reason, but after that, they're genuinely locked in. And if there's an out, it's for performance, and if it is for performance, that you have a cure period. So homework assignment for everyone, go read your customer contracts, and see how they, how they function. Uh, further on those things is, is the idea of the auto renewal. And, and back to uh, contracts expiring, right? So to go back to the customer, of course, every time, every year, every two years. If you can build an auto renewal in, you, know, you just don't have to do that. It's gonna, it's gonna automatically be current. And you can also put in some price escalations, right? So I'm sure the cost of your employees have been going up pretty regularly. Have, have your prices kept up? And, you know, again, I know that's not easy to do. But, you know, that's one of the things when, uh, you know, in all this M&A, when someone else is examining your firm, you know, they're looking at the future and the future costs. So if employees keep rising and the revenue isn't, you know, that's, that's a problem. The other big issue we see in contracts is assignments. Uh, for whatever reason, there was a bunch of attorneys <laughs> that don't, don't get this, and they put in your customer contracts that the customer has to approve in writing any assignment of that agreement. So does anyone know for sure they, they don't have an assignment issue in their contracts? Okay, this is really, this is a big one, guys. So uh, th this is essentially what happens. When you sell the company, right, on, uh, on the sell side, and you have language in your agreement that says the customer needs to provide written approval, well, then you gotta get that approval before you close your deal, not after, right? If there's, if there's no assignment requirement, right, you tell them after the fact with your new company, hey, we're bigger, we're better, right? This is definitely the kind of situation where you wanna ask for forgiveness later, right, kind of thing. Uh, but with, uh, with that clause, you actually have to go to every single customer you have and get them, tell them what's gonna happen. They might say no. If a couple of the top ones say, no, I don't like the idea, and I've seen this happen, you kind of just killed your, your deal, potentially. Um, you know, the other thing is just logistics, right? How do you get to 60 customers inside, you know, the week before you close your deal? So really, there's some big, big ramifications. And anyone who's ever had this problem, when I talked to the owner, they had no idea. They had no idea it was written that way. Um, the last thing, and you probably know this, 
being, you know, ConnectWise users and for some of you who are part of Evolve and so forth. But, uh, you know, the best practice these days, obviously, an MSA as sort of your base T's and C's and then SOWs after that. What we've seen more recently is having an online MSA and the language in the SOW is pointing to the most current. And this way, again, just back to having everything sort of current and, and, and accurate, it's just a, it's a best practice for customer contracts. Okay. So, like I said, it's not just customers, there's vendors too. And essentially, same kind of advice, store them digitally, right, keep, keep track, know their terms. So how does the vendor agreement affect you? Kind of a lot of the same stuff, right? Are, are they expiring? Are they auto-renewing? A lot of times we see situations where, you know, we're post LOI, the deal's not quite closed, we're just beginning to do due diligence, deep due diligence, to find out that some vendor that the buyer didn't really want, hey, they just renewed for three years, like two weeks ago. Uh, you know, it would be real helpful to have known that ahead of time. Right? No one wants to leave the seller in the lurch with agreements like that. So, so just know all these terms. What are, what are their out clauses and cure periods and assignment issues? The other thing folks are often surprised to learn, especially if you go through distribution, uh, is often they will have a lien on your assets, right, in terms of giving you your terms and so forth. Uh, and depending on how long you've been doing it, you know, they do that in the beginning. Often you just have to call and ask them to release it. Right? You've proven that you have uh, the ability to pay and so forth after so many years. But uh, when, you're, when you're doing a, a deal, often they're, they're asset purchases. They can be stock purchases. But on the asset side, if your assets are encumbered because somebody has a lien on you, guess what? You can't sell the company until it's released. Not the hardest thing to figure out, but again, to get ahead of it. Is, is the advice there. On the employee side, on employment contracts, same thing, right? So here's my list of employees, but when it comes to diligence, all right, where are all the offer letters, right? We need to see that information, we need to see when they started and the proof of that. Um, but even, even more so, whether it's an offer letter or an employment agreement, is non-solicits and confidentiality agreements. And if you don't have them with your employees, it's okay to go back to them, maybe January 1st. My attorney made me do it, right? <laughs> uh, we have a new non-solicitation confidentiality agreement that you need to sign. So all of this is, again, transferring risk to, to a buyer. Uh, you know, if, if an employee after a deal decides to leave and they have no non-solicit, hey, listen, it's very well possible that they can go after your customers, right? It depends on who, who owns the relationship. We'll talk a little more about that. So. Uh, just another thing to be aware of from a contract standpoint. Let's see what time. Okay. So customers, uh, again, the lifeblood of all our businesses, right? Uh, besides the assignment issue that we'll often see in contracts, the other thing that I see way too much is customer concentration, right? The so-called key customers. And I bet many of you have them. In fact, if you don't mind, who can tell me if you have a customer that's more than 10% of, of your company? Anybody? Okay. So again, great while it's coming in, but big, big risk to a buyer. In fact, in terms of table stakes, sometimes a key customer situation is just a no-go. You, know, you have somebody that's 10% is kind of borderline, right? Certainly that's where it starts, but I've seen 20, 30, 50, 60% of a company between two clients. Well, that's a, that's a lot of risk, right? So um, that's gonna, at a minimum, reduce your value, and someone's gonna wanna put some contingencies in the deal terms. You're gonna get less, less cash up front. Uh, but more often than not, it's just, it's a, no, a non-starter. You know, a lot of the private equity companies, if there's a customer concentration issue, psh, see you later, nothing to do about it. What can you do about it? Sell against it, easier said than done, right? <laughs> um, but you can mitigate it contractually if you actually have a multi-year agreement in place with real teeth, right, not the out for any reason, some breakup fees, that, that can totally squash it, right? So someone's in a, I have a key customer, but they're locked up for X number of years. Still better not to have them at all, but that's, that's a, it's a mitigator. Uh, focus on your best customer. Simple idea, a lot of people, of course, focus on the squeaky wheel, the noisy customer, the one that's, you know, the loudest. 
Um, and, and often they're not profitable, but the thing is this, most MSPs don't know which customers are their profitable ones or not. I mean, some do, <laughs> but, but, but a lot don't. Uh, I, you know, we have a lot of first time calls with companies to learn about who they are and what they do. And um, they're often extremely proud to share that they've never lost a customer. Well, that, that's kind of a, a red flag, to be honest, right? Uh, you sort of want to lose a customer every one. They can't all be great. <laughs> so, uh, but even you know, if they are, kudos. But go ahead and you know, fire the unprofitable clients. There's going to be more availability to serve the best customers. Focus on them. Um, profitable by client, like I said, is, is, is really key. And rarely do we see people you know, able to do it. So you should know that. You should know your, your cost plus margins. You, whether you charge per user or per device, you should still know, on average, what your per user fee is, what your per device comes to, what your average hourly rate comes to. Because the buyer is going to want to know that. And again, just for yourself, you should know. You may very well find that uh, you know, your, your best customer, the, often these big key ones are the ones who, who make you the least, quite honestly. Uh, customer sat, CSAT. Who, who does uh, customer satisfaction surveys? Who does ones that aren't just ticketing you know, surveys, but actual overall CSAT? Much smaller number, much smaller, right? Like five hands. So listen, the how do we do on the ticket is great. It goes off into the end user or what have you. But what you want to know is the overall happiness with your point of contact there, the, the owner of that business or the VP or whoever it is, right? Um, doing a regular customer satisfaction like a uh, MPS score you know, type thing, it, first of all, the buyer's going to do that. Right? If you're not doing it, that's one of the first things. They can't speak to your customers before the deal closes, but not typically. <laughs> you know, uh, assignment issue, maybe, they, they'll, they'll have to. But uh, they're going to do it. So why don't you do it? And if you find out there's some issues or problems, you know, have an, a, a, an opportunity to, to fix that. So those are some of the things uh, around customers. The other thing is um, you know, be, be tight in your demographics. Uh, this chart will make more sense in a second, right? Define a sweet spot, 25 to 100, 5 to 50 million in revenue, what have you. This whole no job too big, too small, it's a recipe for disaster. Right? I talk to companies, tell me about your customer size. Well, we have some that are you know, 5 to 10 users, and we have a couple of 500,000 users. Wow. <laughs> if you actually pin them down and go, what's 98% of them? Oh, 20 to 50 you know, user organization. So uh, listen, you're going to have outliers. It's fine. I'm talking about the bell curve. Because selling to, as you know, an under 15 user organization versus 30 to 100 versus 500 to 1,000, it's different marketing. It's different sales. It's probably different services. And again, there are plenty of companies who are, who are doing that, right? They're just saying yes to everything. So keep a tight com customer demographic. Uh, back to fit with a buyer. You know, if you're all over the place, you're probably not going to fit with just about anybody, right? Because they're going to have, hopefully, a little bit better of a, of a strategy. Um, and then when it comes to horizontals or verticals, this is a little bit to do with, um, you know, again, geography, revenue. I mean, it's kind of you are what you are. But you should certainly know, if you're in a couple of key verticals, what their actual contribution to your business is. Um, you know, how many there are, revenue, sure. But again, bottom line, uh, understand that. Because that could be a real differentiator, too. If, if you are servicing a vertical and actually have some chops in their business processes, certainly, and the buyer has an interest there, that's going to get you on sort of the higher end of, of the value spectrum. So let's talk about customer tenure and churn and so forth. And it's a, it's a little bit of a, a double-edged sword, a couple of these things around tenure, right? So, Long tenured clients are great. No one wants to see that the clients are flipping over every, every year, of course, right? Um, as long as they're not legacy clients. So sometimes, you know, back to the, hey, I've never fired a client. Uh, it's great to hold on to them, but if, if you have all the older ones, oh, I never upsold them on the new model, right? They're all still T&M, or they're locked, they're grandfathered in. Right? That's what I call legacy clients. Legacy clients are a problem. You're probably better off doing what you can to convert them or, or, or let them go. 
Um, so net new clients is great, right? Shows so your ability to grow, but like I said, it, it's quality, you know, certainly over quantity. And, and lastly, um, and I don't see this that often, but sometimes in, in sales-driven organizations, which most MSPs by and large, again, smaller ones certainly are a little more service-oriented, but sales-driven ones, you know, they're out there chasing the next deal to the detriment of existing customers, right? So what you've heard, hey, you know, one comes in the front door, one goes in the back door. Or worse, one comes in the front door, two go in the back door. Um, buyers are going to look at that. They're going to kind of um, look at trends, right? That's why a moment in time P&L or, or roster of your clients, uh, that's why people look for years of, of historical you know, trends. And it's for things like that. So let's move on to uh, employees. So another thing that we often see, and no offense to anybody in the Midwest, but we happen to see this a lot in the Midwest, is what we call a staff infection, right? Hiring just too many folks. Hey, how big is your company? I got 25 people, right? And that, but they're only making a million dollars in revenue. So uh, as you know, you know, uh, hire slowly, right? Uh, employees are the lifeblood of your business, just like your customers are, but less is more, I think. After talking with so many, gosh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of MSPs over the years for all of us at Cogent, um, having fewer but seasoned folks is, is generally the way to go. Um, and in terms of overstaffing, in terms of hiring ahead of time, you know, there's a big difference between investment and speculation, as we say. So 10% is a good kind of overstaffing level to keep under. Um, the tenure, again, similar to the customer tenure uh, situation, right? Um, if you have them for a long time, that's great. I mean, it speaks to you're a great place to work and maybe you have a terrific culture, but there could be other reasons why your employees never left. And you just gotta be careful. And this is what buyers are gonna be looking at too, right? Are you just never letting anyone go because you, you know, there's no poor performers? You know, there's that whole kind of bottom 10% thing. Maybe. You're overpaying them, though unlikely today, but <laughs> we've seen it. Uh, or more so, underworking. You know, they honestly don't do that much. And so, yeah, of course they're not gonna go anywhere. So that's the kind of the flip side of, of the well-tenured uh, employee, as well as possibly uh, the pay, the, the pay rate, uh, rate that they, they're at. If, if everyone's been there for 20 years, it's gonna be a pretty hefty um, you know, salary burden. So uh, the other thing, talent. Buyers are looking at this. Yeah, yeah they're looking at P&Ls, obviously. They're looking at all these trends. But especially, like I said, if you're in a vertical market or if there's some sort of capability, whether it's SharePoint or some other ERP or what have you, um, you know, hiring for, for talent is, is, is key. But just don't. Don't that let that be the only uh, obstacle to, uh, to being able to deliver a service. In other words, I've seen the, just like you have key customers, you know, you have key employees. Hey, with this whole line of business is because of Joe. And if Joe leaves, right, that business is at risk. Well, again, a buyer's gonna look at that and discount it. And again, in your own operation, I think all this advice is even in your own operation, it's, you know, it's a risk for yourself. Um, exempt versus non-exempt. I'm seeing these issues, every state's you know, a little different, but generally, if someone's exempt from overtime, if you, if you think they are, uh, I'll tell you, you really have to get some HR advice and speak to uh, a human resource professional and find out the rules in your particular state, because what happens is we've done a few deals where the seller you know, was not paying overtime, but that was, that was incorrect, right? And so now the buyer, when they bring them on, is going to be, therefore, all the cost of those people effectively just went up, right? And so what happened to the earnings that are being acquired as well? They just went down, and your evaluation just went down. So be really cognizant about status, exempt versus non-exempt. It's not about title and so forth. So who owns the customer relationships? We all talk about, well, you know, the cust you know we want the relationship to be with the business. Right? But businesses don't have relationships, people do. And so you, you have to really 
definitely uh, be aware of, of who owns these customer relationships. Certainly try to spread it out amongst a couple of people. Uh, foster those, those folks. Make sure in a transaction, they're the ones who would definitely be sticking around. Again, it's just another risk and a big one, right? Who owns the relationship? That's, what, that's really what you guys are selling. And then the other thing is middle management. Again, it depends if you're at that point, what size you are. But you know, a company that is exclusively relying on that founder, again, big, big risk for the buyer. You know, nobody can make you stay. They can hire you. They can give you a package. They can't make you stay. And if everything is um, you know, due to your personal relationships and your personal know-how, that's going to be a problem. So you know, build, build your team so that everyone's involved. It's going to give the buyer a lot more confidence that, hey, over time, there's other people here who can, who can manage this business. And like I said, otherwise, they're going to kind of ding you for that in, in how they look at valuation. It was, it was not just a multiplier, as we'll talk more about. So getting into some of the financial sort of best practices, so forth. Um, Along with staff infection, we call it top line disease, right? <laughs> More revenue is not always better, right? It's about profits and margin. Uh, one, of, one, of a, one of our first clients, and actually uh, just about every really, really successful MSP that I've talked with has uh, focused on profitability. They say, hey, I sold a $2,000 a month client you know, last month, or we landed a new $2,000 a month. I was like, oh, well, so was that 24,000 a year? And like, no, profit, 2,000 profit. They don't even think in terms of revenue, right? They just think about gross margin. And uh, I think that's what you have to do because you know, everyone's enamored with you know, how big are you, what's your top line number. As I always say, you could be $10 million and losing money. You can be $5 million and making a million bucks, right? So top line really has nothing to do with it, guys. Um, and growth, to my point earlier, right? The trend. So obviously, up and to the right, sometimes you can't help it. COVID came along. Luckily, we, we fared through that actually better than most industries. But um, you know, just make sure that things are going in the, in the right direction when you're adding new revenue, because the buyers are going to be projecting out. So if those margins are starting to squeeze, then you're, then you're, you're trending out that squeezed margin you know, even further, and it's going to affect your, your value. Chart of accounts. Um, this is probably a really, really important one. And you know, I know that, especially with ConnectWise, but any PSA, you have just ridiculous amounts of data you know, at your fingertips, hopefully, right? And you can slice and dice your customers and your revenues and everything you do for them. But typically, you're not handing over a PSA in an M&A process, not right away. Eventually, maybe part of diligence. But in terms of really understanding your business initially, it's going to be your P&L and your balance sheet. And so if you have a P&L that simply says revenue, one line item, and I've seen it, right? Um, that's terrible. I mean, the, the buyer has no idea on how to really understand what's the service versus product mix, recurring, et cetera. So at a minimum, you know, one-time service, one-time product, recurring service, recurring product. You can maybe expand from there. And then have the correlating COGS as well, right? So you should have a one-time product cost. You should have a one-time service cost, et cetera. Um, so uh, anyone here spend time or have recently, I mean, hopefully you've adopted, I, I think there's some best practices around your chart of accounts. But um, I, I still, you know, ConnectWise or not, believe me, I still see the single revenue line item sometimes. All right, let's talk a little bit about accrual versus cash and the truth, which ultimately is what rules, right? Everybody's really looking for what is, how's this company really performing? And back to looking at your books, please no more cash accounting. <laughs> you know, who, how many are doing cash accounting? How many know they're doing cash account? Really? Gosh, my, my, uh, four out of five I talked to are doing cash accounting on their, on their P&L, and they're not doing accrual. So if you're not doing it, kudos, that's great, right? It's all about taxes, I understand. And um, I was doing a deal earlier in the year, and someone said, oh, well, you're, you know, you're off by about $200,000 in revenue. I'm like, really? Well, how can that be? And 
well, those checks are in my drawer because you know we're cash accounting, and I don't want to. I don't know. It's December. I'm waiting until January to deposit them. Right? Yeah. Oldest trick in the book. Uh, bad idea. You know, you're just damaging uh, the truth, quite honestly. And then even if it can be explained, it's uh, you know it's taken with a little bit more, not a grain of salt, but just a little less reliable. Right? So there's a lot of lifestyle businesses out there. You're running everything through your company. You know, every meal, every vacation, every boat, and every whatever. Hopefully you have one or none. Um, so try to do that less. You know, the next point here, I say, hey, eliminate all lifestyle businesses. But the asterisk is, listen, I, I understand you're probably not going to do all of it. But something I've seen is there's sort of a travel and entertainment A and a travel and entertainment B in your chart of accounts. And the owner knows, oh, yeah, everything in B is kind of maybe not really a business expense, right? Um, but they can identify it, you know, and back to being responsive and being organized and knowing what's what and having your books ready. If you're going to do this, isolate it. Better yet, don't do it. <laughs> uh, and do them regularly. So in a, in a due diligence process, and especially in a growing MSP, you know, if you're adding MRR pretty regularly, you know, the business can look materially different from one quarter to the next, or one month to the next. And if it takes two months to get your books and records done because my accountant does them for me and you're in arrears and what have you, you know, maybe you can get away with that one time, but in due diligence, you know, it's constantly reviewed. Um, just just kind of stay on it regularly. Also, like the balance sheet, you know, we see adjustments sometimes or just, you know, annually. Um, it's better than none, which I've also seen. But you know, monthly and so forth. Uh, a couple of more sort of financial points here. You know, AR, the balance sheet. You know, in an asset deal, a buyer's not really buying your, your balance sheet, quote unquote. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't have you know good financials. And uh, I'd say you know, be aware of slow pairs. You can have a terrific business, and what we see is really awful collections and. Uh, Day sales outstanding, which is DSO. You want to keep that to 30 days or less. Right? Uh, billing in advance. So I imagine there's a couple of billing in advance. There's billing in advance on the 1st of January for January. There's billing in advance in December for January. There's um, you know, different ways to do it. What we've seen, and you know, certainly from a collections perspective, is going to be your best bet. If you can... You know, send that bill out the month before it's due, due next month. You know, and then your chances of getting it, you know, on the first, second, third of the month you're delivering services, that you know, that's the way to go. Uh, there's going to be not everything is bundled in fixed fee. I understand. So there's tr you know T and M and so forth. You want to do that weekly. Don't wait till the whole month is over. Right? You're not the bank. The other thing and another big point, which people may or may not know is all these prepaids, and they're great, you know, get your money in faster, that's why we got the running cash guy. <laughs> but, um, but it's deferred revenue, and you didn't earn it yet, right? So what we like to say is you're the custodian of that money, thank you very much, it is not yours yet, it is a liability, right? You haven't yet delivered those services. And what you may not realize, especially in an M&A transaction, if you're selling block time agreements and you have, you know, $100,000 in block time prepays that you owe your, your clients, that $100,000 was not yours. I hope you didn't spend it, because you got to give it to the buyer, because they're going to be delivering. Does that make sense? So EBITDA, we all talk about EBITDA and EBITDA multipliers. Uh, it's really a non-GAAP calculation, right? It doesn't conform to generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, Warren Buffett is pretty well respected, right? People who use EBITDA are either trying to con you or they're conning themselves. Charlie Munger, right? His partner. Every time you see the word EBITDA, you should substitute the phrase bullshit earnings. <laughs> I love that one. Um, you know, it can be manipulated. The truth is most MSPs don't have a lot of it, duh, in the EBITDA, right? Unless you have a lot of fixed assets and equipment and so forth, there's not a lot of it, it. It tends to be synonymous with free cash flow, but it isn't always. And we'll talk a little more about that. 
Uh, so free cash flow, that is what you're looking for. It's gap, and it's the true measure of a business's worth. And um, when, we, when we look at businesses, that's ultimately what, what buyers are trying to understand. So that's, that's it. All right. Hope that was helpful. That was